Hey, Augies, before we dive into the micro BITX discussion, here's a screenshot of the entire amateur 40 meter band. 7 megahertz is down here with 7.1, 7.2, and 7.3 is shown. Taken on January 1st around 0245 UTC, or in Colorado, 7.45 p.m. on December 31st, this is in the middle of the annual ARRL straight key night. The amount of activity in the CW portion of the band shows CW is certainly alive and well. By the way, this white blob here is FT8, the new and very popular digital mode. So, I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG, here with episode 113 of Ask Dave. Today's subject is the new micro BITX radio available from hfsignals.com in Hyderabad, India, and I probably horribly pronounced that. These are the same people who brought us the BITX 40 40 meter single sideband QRP rig. The brainchild behind these two radios is Ashar Farhan, VU2ESE. The new micro BITX goes well beyond the capabilities of its little brother. It's an all band HF, SSB, and CW QRP transceiver. The big draw is the price, 109 US dollars, including shipping by India Post, which in turn comes to you via the US Postal Service. For an extra $10, the radio will come to you via DHL, shaving the shipping time by a couple weeks. When you open the package, you find a cardboard box housing a plastic box that has three main bundles inside. The first and most important is the radio itself, completely assembled and tuned. Next bundled together are the display board and the Reduino board, both of which are simply plug-in boards. The third is a bag of the various controls and sockets and various wiring to be soldered together. Now, Farhan's target audience are experimenters, makers, and builders. He leaves to the builder to find and cut and drill a chassis, the knobs, and some sort of mounting for the microphone. Note his choices of what to leave out. His rationale is that providing these would greatly increase the price, and of course he's right. The dilemma is that the average ham doesn't have the tooling to cut and modify an aluminum chassis, let alone fabricate one. Inspired by the way Randy, K7AGE, first mounted his first BITX40, I spent half a day drilling and preparing one of my wife's cake pans as a mount that would hold the micro BITX as well as provide a place to hold the controls and sockets. Note that the micro BITX sits as king of the hill atop the cake pan. It looks cool and all, but this is no permanent housing. I am fortunate to have a drill press, which was invaluable in drilling holes. I have a knob for the right hand control, which is the tuning slash function knob, but the volume control uses an odd size shaft that I haven't yet found a knob for. I took my time during the assembly and paid close attention to every connection. I did have to desolder one connection and the flux slash braid method worked well. Also, I put in a 5 amp fuse in line and I'm pleased to say it worked the first time I applied power. Now, the microphone element and switch are provided. You can see them here. I taped them to a pen to give me a way to hold on to them. Note this is just a mic element. An element without its housing will give poor frequency and phase response, but it does work. I listen to myself. Although a bit boomy coming in over my FTDX3000, meaning emphasizing lower frequencies, it works. 
and it works on CW. I think I detect a bit of a back wave, or in other words, the VFO leaking through, but it is not objectionable. So let's discuss this for a minute. The stated market is for ham radio experimenters, but there is also a market for the new generals who might like an HF radio to play with while saving their money for something more serious. Lots of people inhabit the second category and this radio would be a good fit, although normally I do not recommend QRP for a first radio. You can certainly listen to all of the HF bands and by answering the CQs of strong stations, you can actually converse on the air. The issue is that the new ham, or for that matter, many more experienced hams, do not have the metal shop chops to build their own housing. I think this latter need should be addressed by someone, somewhere in the world, providing a kit of the remaining components, such as chassis, knobs, plugs, and so on, required to turn the UBITX into a complete radio. Of these, the chassis is the most important. Now, I know there are gobs of people who inhabit the popular BITX forum who will find this anathema. The rig was built with experimentation in mind. Although many of the circuit components are surface-mounted device, Farhan has left gobs of real estate available for changes. Also, you have access directly to the Raduino board for programming changes. The Raduino board is a combination of an Arduino Nano and the popular SI5351 VFO chip with its supporting components. The tuning dial, which is a rotary encoder, tells the Raduino to tell the SI5351 to go to the right frequency. It's really a very cool design using a concept very similar to the QRP Labs QCX rig I reviewed recently. Also, via the rotary encoder, a number of menus provide additional functions, which are band selection, receiver incremental tuning or RIT, a second VFO, the ability to transmit on the opposite sideband, which you'll need on 60 meters, by the way, the CW keyer speed, and a special factory setup mode that you won't need to use. So, how does it do on the air? Well, given I assembled it yesterday, I haven't been able to snag anyone for a CW or single sideband QSO. I will tell you two things I learned while listening. It has beautiful audio, and it rather badly needs some form of automatic gain control, or AGC. In fact, Farhan states he left one side of a dual op amp unused, so it could be used as an AGC amplifier if someone wants. I'm sure someone will come up with a mod. If so, you'll probably find it on the very active BITX forum at https colon slash slash groups dot io slash g slash BITX20. And that last part is in caps. Note the 20. That's for a very old design, but the forum continues to encompass all the BITX models. The tuning knob has a variable rate. As you tune slowly, it tunes in fine increments. Turn it quickly and the increments get bigger. I think I'll tweak this in the software because right now it's easy to skip half a megahertz down the band if you tune too fast. It is a nice feature, but I want to tame it a bit. On CW, using my battery power source, it puts out about 5 watts, not the 10 watts suggested on the hfsignals.com website. I note that 5 watts on CW should enable plenty of contacts. On single sideband, even with a full-throated ah, it puts out 3 or 4 watts of power, which means the average power will be about half that or less. In an era of 100-watt rigs, the SSB output 
is definitely in the peanut whistle class. The rig is in permanent semi-QSK mode. To send CW, you merely press the key. It goes into CW simply by pressing this key and semi-QSK means that the receiver stays off for long enough of an interval that you can send more characters if you wish. If, however, you send slowly, it will try to bounce back to receive before you're ready to send the next character. I did notice that while calling CQ, that sometimes the system would drop a dit or da. Given that the code is formed in the Raduino, this may reflect a limitation in design. The system does have a built-in keyer. You have to wire up your keyer with a couple of resistors in the line. The rig detects which resistor value is in use and accordingly sends dits or daws or acts as the normal key. The keyer speed can be set in the menu. I've never seen this approach, which in essence self-detects whether a paddle or a straight key is attached. It's a rather cool technique. Note that there is only one received bandwidth, the one for single sideband. That means on CW you'll hear potentially dozens of CW signals and you'll need to filter them out in your brain. One last thing. As I said, this is a multi-band HF rig with a general coverage receiver. One would properly expect that you could transmit on all ham bands, but the rig also transmits on all other bands too. Not only is it a general coverage receiver, it's also a general coverage transmitter. Farhan says that some experimenters need to generate signals pretty much anywhere in the HF bands. However, I have serious and major objections to this design choice and strongly urge Farhan to rewrite the software for all future copies of this rig to confine transmission to the ham bands. As it stands now, any novice builder or careless ham could be putting signals out anywhere on the HF band. Given the number of HF services and their criticality, this is dangerous. This feature alone makes the radio ineligible for FCC type acceptance. Now that I have that off my chest, I must say this is a remarkably interesting radio for experimenters and makers. When ready-cut chassis are available, either from HF signals or from some other source, the market broadens considerably to new generals or to someone just wanting to have a nifty little second rig. The radio as it stands is solid and has great audio. And for only US $109, it's a great way to become exposed to HF. You order from hfsignals.com. You'll use PayPal and you can use your credit card or your PayPal balance. Note that the popularity of this radio is so high that they're running a bit behind on orders. Even though I ordered with DHL shipping, it didn't ship until 10 days after because they were working so hard to catch up. So be patient. Be sure to tune in to Tom Medlin, W5KUB. He has a live weekly show every Tuesday evening at 9 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time or 6 p.m. U.S. Pacific Time. Go to W5KUB.com to see the show. There's also a way to ask questions in real time. I'm a frequent guest on the show. In late December 2017, Ashar Farhan himself was the featured guest, and I had a chance to pose questions myself. So, Augies out there, please click like and please subscribe and share. If you'd like to know how you can support my videos, go to www.dcastler.com support. Until we next meet, 73. 
Next week, we'll get the MFJ Cobweb back on the air and add the 30 and 40 meter extensions.